All right, everyone, well, let's get started. So I'm Greg, this is Vinayak, we're from Google. We're gonna talk about how crypto miners have been exploiting some uh, RBAC misconfigurations. Whoa, that was not a good slide transition. Try that again. So if you were paying attention to the press back in March, March or April, beginning of this year, you might have seen some headlines along these lines, uh, there's these uh, new attacks that are uh, leveraging Kubernetes are back to backdoor clusters. We saw some of that happening on, on GKE, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the root cause, and which was actually a customer misconfiguration of the cluster, and we're going to walk through the whole attack, do a demo of the attack, and talk about the prevention and detection options for the, that attack. I thought it might be interesting just to cover a little bit about what's actually new here. We've had Kubernetes misconfigurations before. We've had Docker ports exposed to the inter internet. We've had Kubelet ports on the internet. We've had dashboard, uh, Kubernetes dashboards exposed to the internet. And there's been scanners out there targeting all those things. So that's not really that new. Uh, the other thing that isn't really that new is container delivered crypto miners. That's a thing that's been around for quite a while now. Uh, you can find you know, well packaged uh, container crypt crypto miners on Docker Hub. The, the new and interesting thing here is, is some Kubernetes-specific hiding techniques that the attacker used and, and the way they persisted. So we'll, we'll cover that in a fair amount of detail. Really quick sort of high-level overview of the attack. The root cause here was, as I said, was this uh, customer RBAC misconfiguration that effectively kind of gave the whole internet cluster admin, and you might be like, I would never do that. Uh, but if you're just Googling for access control advice on the internet and finding pages that give you bad advice, there's definitely pages out there that will tell you to do this, uh, to create this binding. So it's not perhaps as unusual as you would think. So the attacker was out there on the internet scanning for this kind of misconfiguration, found, found this one. They came in, created a whole bunch of different access to give themselves control over the cluster, and then they also did a little bit of, of covering their tracks as well too. So we have Google Cloud signals that uh, detected this crypto miner activity and alerted the customer about it. We also helped them out with the investigation to figure out what was going on. And once we'd done that, we also looked at who else had made this misconfiguration. There were a handful of other customers that had sort of done something similar, so we notified them. And then uh, we actually prevent it by default now. And we'll talk about that in more detail in just a bit. And I'm just gonna hand it over to Vinayak to give you a demo. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so yeah, before we jump into the attack demo, I just wanted to cover a few Kubernetes concepts. So the first one is cluster admin. A lot of you probably know about this role, but uh, cluster admin gives, is a default role that Kubernetes creates and gives all permissions for all resources. And if you start using it in cluster role bindings, then you give those permissions across every namespace. So essentially kind of giving root in cluster. Uh, and we kind of think of it as uh, analogous to uh, root on Linux, where like, hey, having these broad permissions is sometimes useful for some users to do maintenance or management, but it has to be wielded very carefully, and so uh, don't go delete it, but uh, also make sure that you're not, you're, you're auditing who's able to have these permissions. Uh, oops, sorry. And so uh, the other thing that we wanted to talk about was some system users and groups that might be helpful uh, to know before we go into the demo. Is, and so here I've kind of got a diagram of uh, Kubernetes auth. And so when a request comes in, there's like a bunch of authenticators that can like, uh, that Kubernetes has based on your configuration. And then that request can, three things can happen. The first thing is that it's a successful request. So like basically you have a token and that token is valid and then the authenticator says, yep, this is valid, and then your identity provider, based on the authenticator you have, assigns the user, and then the group is system authenticated, um, and so that kind of indi uh, indicates that, hey, this user was authenticated, and then that information gets passed on to Odzi. The other uh, flip side of this could be that you have an invalid token, and so there's just a failure, and so you get a 401. Uh, but the third case is that you don't have any auth information, and in that case, if you have anonymous auth enabled, what happens is that this anonymous authenticator is used, and all it does is it sets the user to system anonymous, and then sets the group to system unauthenticated, which kind of indica indicates that, hey, I don't know who this person is, and they did not authenticate, but since anonymous auth is enabled, uh, that information will 
that request won't be rejected and will be, will be passed down to uh, auth z. Uh, okay. okay, so you must be thinking, hey, why does system anonymous exist? And uh, it's on by default in KDS, and KDS creates this binding called system uh, public info viewer, uh, which lets you look at like health status and like cluster versions and stuff like that. And a lot of load balancers use this. Uh, QADM also relies on this to do some like um, private key information exchange during like QADM cluster bootstrap. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, if you watch the demo for uh, by SIG auth, they were also using this for uh, checking the health Z. So like, yeah, there's like valid scenarios where um, system anonymous and system unauthenticated uh, can be used. And then a node on system authenticated, uh, like a lot of you might be thinking, oh, this is, this is fine, like it's authenticated, but based on your cluster setup or your identity provider setup, this might mean a lot of things. It can mean like, hey, no one, uh, and require some additional setup in your cloud provider, or it could mean everyone at your company, it could mean all, uh, everyone at that identity provider that you're using, and so in GKE, it actually means, uh, uh, GKE kind of aligns with IAM's uh, all authenticated user, which means like anyone with a Google account. But uh, one note is that this is uh, authentication and not authorization. So just because they can like access the cluster doesn't mean they might, uh, doesn't mean they have like any valid permissions in it. All right, and now I'll move to the demo. Which way is it? Cool. Uh, so let's first look at the customer misconfiguration here. So the customer created a cluster role binding where they bound cluster admin, the super powerful role, to uh, system anonymous. And when they create this such a binding, they basically give anybody who can access the QABS server unrestricted access to the uh, cluster. And so attackers are usually scanning. So like now we are on the attacker machine. Attackers are running this super complicated scanning script, and then. Uh, they find a target, and so this is the first thing that the attacker did in this cluster. Based on our investigation, they created a cluster role binding, and they named it Cube Controller Manager. And uh, if that name sounds familiar, it's because it's a core component of Kubernetes, so this was like one of the attempts to kind of hide in the system noise. And then they bound the role cluster admin to uh, the default service account of Cube System namespace. So Essentially, any workload that runs in Cube System namespace that does not specify a service account gets the default service account. And so, uh, if a workload does not specify the service account, in this case, they will run as admin. And so, this was an, another way to like kind of hide uh, in uh, hide the permissions that a workload might have. And so, they created a workload after that. So they named it Cube Controller. They ran it in Cube System namespace. Uh, this was the daemon set, and they even uh, attempted to like kind of Hide, make the image look legitimate by like almost spelling like Kubernetes IO. Uh, so, so that was another attempt they made to kind of hide. Uh, and then uh, as you notice in the spec, they don't have a service account specified. So this is running as the default service account in the cube system name space. And so this workload is running as cluster admin based on the binding that they made. Um, and so once they have this, they have a foothold and this workload is running like uh, is, is running the crypto miner, but they actually tried to install persistence, so this was happening from within the daemon set now. So the first thing they did was create a CSR, uh, which is a certificate, certificate signing request, and it's a way to like send a request to QBPI server to get like a certificate signed that you can later use to authenticate with QBPI server. And so uh, let's look at this like large base64 uh, blob here. And so all, all I'm doing here is like Getting that, extracting that from the YAML and then sending it, uh, base64 decoding it and sending it to uh, OpenSSL. And you can see the subject here is set to common name equals uh, cluster admin. So common name, uh, CN here stands for a common name. And so anybody who presents that certificate to QBAPI QB server now, uh, their user will be treated as cluster admin. So they'll show up as user cluster admin. So this is another attempt to hide. Um, so now, uh, once this CSR is created, somebody has to go approve it, right? Uh, usually that's cluster admin, but lucky for them, they already have this permission, and so they can approve their own CSR. And once a CSR gets approved, there's controllers in Kubernetes that will go and sign it. And so let's check if the CSR is signed. Uh, yeah, 
So yeah, you're getting the CSR, and as you can see, it's issued. So now they can extract the certificate, and then what the attacker did was uh, they also deleted the CSR to kind of hide their tracks. Uh, CSRs which are approved are also auto-deleted, so. Uh, OK. So now the attacker has a identity, right? They have this user cluster admin that they've, uh, they've, they've got, but that user has no bindings. So the attacker then created another binding, uh, and in this case, they bound cluster admin to that user cluster admin and giving it. So now anybody who holds the certificate has like unrestricted access to the cluster. So now the attacker is back on their machine, and now they can like if you see what permissions they have based on the certificate. Uh, they have all the permissions, so they're a happy crypto miner. They can they can access this cluster even if that initial uh, misconfiguration has been removed. Okay, now. This one. Okay, cool. Uh, so some further observations from this attack. Uh, the time to exploitation was eight days, which means that from the time the uh, customer created the misconfiguration to the first signs of malicious activity that we noticed was eight days. Uh, what was really unique here was they're trying to like blend into the system noise by like creating controllers that had like uh, creating daemon sets with had like cube controller names in the cube, con uh, cube system namespace, which is where customers usually run their, uh, customers are asked not to run their workloads because that's reserved for system workloads, trying to use like a semi-legit looking image, or even using the trick of like relying on default service accounts where like if you don't carefully look at the YAML, you might miss some information. Uh, the payload itself was XM rig, so nothing special here. Uh, the daemon set was actually running some kind of script that was running kubectl commands. Uh, this was based off the user agent. And then finally, one thing that we noticed was that they actually pushed multiple uh, image updates to the daemon set. And in the past, we've usually seen people uploading, uh, updating their payload by like doing it in payload, but they actually relied on like Kubernetes deployments and daemon sets to like update their payload. So that was uh, very unique about this attack. Um, and so with that, I've covered the attack portion of it, and so I'm going to hand it to Greg to cover the prevention and detection. Okay, let's talk about prevention. If we think about the misconfiguration surface here, we sort of demoed in detail that first one, this system anonymous mis misconfiguration. You could do basically the same thing with system unauthenticated, so system anonymous is a user, system unauthenticated is a group, but they're basically the same, uh, same group of anyone on the internet kind of stuff. Uh, and then there's also the system authenticated that we talked about, which varies depending on your configuration. And so if we think about each of those, there's like three different principles here. There's two different places you can bind them, those, uh, those, pr those permissions at the cluster and the namespace level. So that's six different combinations of like possible things you might need to worry about. So we wrote them all out. There's a link here uh, to, the, to the GitHub where all the demo code is. You can see exactly like all that YAML. But when we're thinking about prevention, we're going to try and think about this, this whole group of, uh, of misconfigurations as possible. Big list of prevention options here. We're going to step through each one of these and, and talk about them in, in some detail. So, so the first kind of like most obvious one was this was an internet exposed API server. If that wasn't network reachable, then this wouldn't have, wouldn't have been a problem or it would have only been a, a smaller problem uh, rather than having everyone on the internet. It's everyone who can like actually get to the API server. And so if you're thinking about limiting network access to the API server, there's some other advantages why that's, that's occasionally a good thing to have, too. There's some denial of service protection. You, you might get some protection from other authentication or authorization misconfigurations, or uh, just vulnerabilities that are in the API server. So there's a couple of different ways you can do that. Uh, you can do both of them. You can run in a private address space that's not routable. You can put a firewall in front of it. On GKE, we let you do both of those things. Uh, and most other managed providers will do, do the same. Second one, let's talk about anonymous OAuth. So if we look at the, what the CIS security benchmark says about anonymous authentication, it says it's like generally reasonable to allow anonymous access if you're using it for health checks and discovery. And that was those uh, load balancer and those kind of uh, use cases that we talked about before. So this setting is true by default. Anonymous OAuth equals true. You can set it to false if you have control of the API server flags. If you're using a managed Kubernetes provider, you might not have that control. You don't have it on GKE. And so I think there's 
more we can do here to make this uh, a safer default. And so we've actually like, got that on the agenda for SIGAuth. And so if you're looking at the slide and thinking, hey, I wish like that was better and we could sort of like restrict this access without breaking stuff, then we, we think the same uh, and we should go talk about it and uh, figure out how we can make this a, a safer default. So moving on, uh, assuming that anonymous auth is on, you can make those, some of those bindings. And so the, the thing we saw in this attack was binding specifically cluster admin to, to one of these, one of these uh, three groups or, or user. And you can prevent that with admission. It's pretty easy to do that with an admission controller. There's a bunch of them lifted, listed here. You could use Gatekeeper, Kavono. You could actually use the new beta feature of the validating admission policy that's being built into Kubernetes now that doesn't even require you to run uh, a separate sort of um, validating admission. And that would block these bindings from happening. So we're going to uh, demo that from happening. On GKE, we're just outright prevented this because th there's really like no good reasons to be doing cluster admin to these particular principles. They're kind of dangerous. So on, on GKE as a 128, this is just blocked outright. You could go a little further. So that's just just cluster admin to just those those users and groups. So we looked into what people are doing with these users and groups. And there's a few different things. We already talked about sort of load balancers and like health checking and that kind of stuff. Uh, KubeADM uses it uh, as part of their bootstrapping. Uh, there's a, there's a, a rancher uses it as a limit, very limited sort of like pre-auth uh, API that they expose. Uh, Bitnami has a, a, a similar thing where they're, they're exposing sort of like a, a very limited subset of functionality just to get the system up and running. And the, the, so if we block any binding, there will be a few things that you might run into. Uh, we also saw people using these for uh, CI/CD metrics to be able to give metrics to a dashboard without having that dashboard have to handle authentication. And there are a lot of pod security bindings to system authenticated. Uh, that's kind of end of life now anyway. So the last version that supports pod security policies is now, is now end of life. So I probably don't need to worry about that one too much. I think generally this is like reasonably safe to do. These are, these are smaller use cases that, that may not actually affect you. And so you can do this with admission and we'll, and we'll do that in the demo as well. Uh, so we talked about a few different uh, kind of combinations there, cluster admin to these groups. And then what about just like bindings that involve cluster admin generally? That's a category that we might want to worry about. And again, the CIS benchmark here is hey, you should probably be careful with cluster admin. It's, it's like the root of Kubernetes. Uh, so be careful who you give it to. It is fairly widely used uh, by both by humans, probably where it shouldn't be, and also by uh, system components. Uh, so you, you can uh, sort of block this, uh, but I, I think I'd like tread fairly carefully. So on GKE, we have a policy controller, like a managed uh, policy you can enforce that will let the pieces of GKE that need this work without breaking GKE. Uh, and so I think if you're going to do this on a, on a managed platform or a platform where you don't have full control about it, just, you just need to sort of like carefully work through that. Uh, but, but it's possible to add restrictions here. So let's demo some of that stuff. So the first thing we're going to do here is just try and grab the secrets out of the cluster. We're completely unauthenticated to this cluster. Uh, we're coming at it from the internet. And you can, so we're not expecting this to work. So you can see here, like, this access is forbidden. We're user system anonymous. And we don't have access to uh, get to secrets in this cluster. And that's, that's working as intended if we get a 403. So if we just look at the role that we're going to add to this cluster, it's the same one that Vinayak talked about, system anonymous to, to cluster admin. And we put that on the cluster. And then we try the same thing, same thing again. And I'm just going to, to avoid a giant blob of text on the screen, I'm just going to like kind of summarize this with jQuery. And so you can see now this works. So we broke the cluster, we gave this authentication, and now like anyone on the internet can come along and get our secrets. So that's bad, and we don't want it to be like that. So we'll delete that role binding again. And now we're going to install Gatekeeper. So Gatekeeper is an open source admission controller. 
And it's going to help prevent those bindings from getting created in the first place. So Gatekeeper requires a constraint template and a constraint. And so what we're doing here is just adding those two things. We're using the disallow anonymous constraint template and constraint that's built into Gatekeeper to prevent those uh, bindings from being created. And we'll try making that binding again. We get an error from Gatekeeper saying, hey, that's not allowed. The unauthenticated user uh, reference is not allowed in this role binding. So that's great. That's how we want things to be. I mentioned on GKE we're blocking this by default. So on, uh, on GKE 128, so we'll just, just create a cluster there and we'll just try the same thing, just making the binding there. Don't have to create any admission controllers or do any other configuration. We're just going to block it outright. So GKE Warden is the, is the built-in admission that GKE has. And it's uh, saying, yeah, you can't bind this uh, cluster admin to system anonymous. Okay. So that's prevention. Let's talk about detection. Three different categories here. We can talk about detection, detecting the misconfiguration, so the thing we did wrong uh, to start with. We can talk about the, what the attacker did on the cluster, the actual exploitation. And then we can talk about the payload itself. And so we'll cover those three categories. Logs are really great here. Uh, so we can find a bunch of stuff in logs. There's sort of three different things we could look for here. We can look for exactly that cluster admin to system user or groups uh, uh, thing happening. And if that's happening, that's really bad. That's the thing we're preventing by default on GKE. But if you're just going to take a detect only strategy, like you definitely want to do this one. Um, Sort of second there is that any bindings to those, those uh, big groups or, or users, um, they may or may not be bad. We talked a couple, about a couple of use cases there where it, it, might, it might be intended. And then the probably more noisy, more used uh, bindings to cluster admin. But you can find all this stuff happening in the logs. We've actually got a bunch of log queries in the, uh, in the slides where you can, if you want to build this kind of detection yourself, you can go do it. We also wrote a little script that will audit your existing role bindings and tell you if you've got exactly this problem, that, you, that, that, that there's bindings that shouldn't be bound to these system users and groups. Uh, on GKE, this is done for you with event uh, threat detection. So it goes and looks at the logs and notifies you about this stuff. Uh, so we're just going to show that quickly. So this is our security command center UI. You can see we've got a couple of high priority findings here. And this critical one is this privilege escalation. So as we were beating up that cluster, misconfiguring it like crazy, ETD was in the background looking at the logs. It's found a bunch of other stuff here too, some like lower severity findings. But there's this uh, critical one here that <clears throat> is related to these uh, back bindings. So we get a description. We get this. Uh, uh, the user that created it, the time, all, all the stuff that you'd sort of expect here. And if we scroll right down, we can we get a link to the actual log, and so we can go look at the details of the log itself and see kind of the full um, um, all the information that, about what happened here and, and who did this, where did they come from, and uh, what did they do. So you can see here, cluster admin binding to system anonymous. Uh, and as I said, that's the, that's the Google version, but there's uh, queries in here to uh, help you write your own uh, similar detection. Uh, OK, so unused permissions. Cluster admin isn't the only sort of privileged role out there. You can just make your own. And you can uh, make your own mistakes uh, with, with your own cluster admin. So you could make a new role that's star star, just like cluster admin, and go bind it to a bunch of stuff that shouldn't have that access. And so this is sort of a more general least privileged permissions problem that uh, you need to think about and, and potentially solve. In terms of open source tools, there's not a whole lot in this area that will help you with this general case. Uh, there's this tool from uh, Palo Alto called RBAC Police that can tell you about some privileged roles, but it won't tell you if they're in use or like how over permissioned uh, it, it is. It'll, it'll just let you know, hey, there's these things that look like they might be over permissioned, but you can't tell if it's actually being used. Uh, 
There are a bunch of third-party tools and a bunch of vendors on the KubeCon floor that will be able to sell you uh, tools that tell you whether uh, your permissions that are, you've granted are being used, and so there's, there's, there's ways to detect this today. Uh, on GKE, we have IAM Recommender that covers this for IAM, and so that if you do your bindings through IAM, then we'll be able to say, hey, there's like six out of 10 of these permissions aren't actually being used regularly, so you could probably slim down this role a bit and get it to something closer to least privilege. And that's really the sort of recommendation we're looking for here. So we're not covering our back just yet. And then the third category was, uh, oh, so the, sorry, the, we, that was the sort of detection of the misconfiguration, and this is the second category, the uh, exploitation detection. So what did the attacker actually do on this cluster? So we can look at system anonymous activities, pretty simple here. Uh, if, that, if the anonymous activity is actually authorized, then that's probably, probably bad, so it's probably a reasonable signal, uh, this one. We can look at that certificate creation work that the attacker was doing. There is a little bit of system use for the CSR API, so depending on sort of which provider you're using and what your own organization is doing with that Kubernetes API, there might be no more noise in this signal. So here I filtered out just the stuff that GKE does with uh, certificates, and so it's, uh, you might have to do similar things. So we, we issue certificates to the kubelet for using this mechanism, so you have to filter those out if you like, don't want noise in this signal. And then the third thing, I think pretty common uh, sort of security problem in the industry is detecting crypto miners. So you can find a lot of vendors that will do this for you, I'm sure. Uh, but so typical techniques, bad IPs, bad domains, the containers themselves, the binaries in those containers. And on GKE, you can opt into uh, having, uh, we've got a whole bunch of crypto mining detection you can turn on. We have event threat detection looking at logs. And then if you actually go opt in and ask us to do it, we can scan the memory of the VM from outside the uh, hypervisor, and that's what VM threat detection does. So we can actually find a, a crypto miner that's running in memory uh, without having an agent. Uh, I, think, I think that's a pretty cool capability. So just summing up here, uh, we had this pretty like, interesting Kubernetes-specific attack. Uh, it, the, in terms of the prevention options, we talked about limiting access to the API server, and then there's a bunch of stuff you can do at RBAC level to uh, sort of uh, prevent those bindings from happening, or, or at least detect ones uh, if, if you're not going to prevent. On, on the detection side, there's also a bunch of strategies here, uh, so you can audit what you've got. So if, say you put in detection today, um, then that will kind of cover you from this point onwards, but you want to sort of look at what you've already got as well too. So uh, there's definitely an auditing uh, part of this that you need to remember to do uh, if you haven't got anything today. And, but so, like, overall, this was, like, pretty good news story, really. So, yes, there was a compromise. Yes, a bad guy was operating in there. But uh, we were able to detect it. We were able to prevent it for, like, everyone else uh, operating on GKE and, and then also share that knowledge with the community. And hopefully others will be able to build a similar prevention uh, and protect everyone by default. So a uh, whole bunch of links here. All the demo code is uh, up on GitHub. You can give us feedback through this, uh, <clears throat> through this QR code. Everything we link to here is, is uh, and that'll also get you to the slides. And uh, at the back of the deck here, we've got some more uh, detection log queries if you want to go build that detection yourself. So happy to take any questions. There's a couple of mics. There's one here and one there if uh, folks have questions. Um, thanks for the talk, really cool. So for that affected customer, did you have to rotate their cert after everything was cleaned up? Yeah, so we gave them some advice about cleanup. Uh, so uh, it's kind of, when, when you have a compromise like this where attacker has cluster admin, it's kind of burn it down, right? Like it, there's, there's not really any coming back from that. And so uh, they were running their own incident response process, but uh, yes. Uh, kind of burn the whole cluster down is, is basically <laughs> basically the advice because they've had complete control in there. And then you also need to look at the trust relationships that that cluster had. So were there secrets in there that give them access to other systems? And you need to think about sort of like those trust relationships as well. Yeah. Right, that makes sense. So if you, um, even if you delete the cluster role, if you still have that certificate, then you essentially always have a way in, right? 
Uh, yeah, if you delete the cluster binding that was the misconfigure, the, the cluster role binding that was the misconfiguration, then, uh, so yeah, if you just kind of were like, oh, I see Anonymous was doing stuff, and I went and looked at what Anonymous did, and Anonymous created this role binding, and so I'm, oh, I'm gonna clean that up and get rid of that role binding, that's not enough, because they have created this like separate certificate that gives them access, even if you cleaned up that misconfiguration that was the entry point, so yeah. Right, I guess my question is, um, inside of that certificate, it said that the group was cluster admin, but then even if you delete everything within your cluster that gives any semantics to cluster admin, them having that cert, they could still essentially get any access they want. So the certificate is for the cluster. So like the, the CA that issued that is for the cluster. So if that cluster is gone, like that's the end of the access. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. Do, you, do you see our back, um, <laughs> do you see our back compromises across cluster and like GKE or Google roles as well? And I'm curious how those two work together. Uh, across cluster. So, um, hmm. I, I guess, I mean, like Google has federation with the service accounts are federated with Kubernetes right, and vice right. versa. Do you see people hopping between a Google role and then a GKE role and then back to Google resources? Right. Yeah, so when, uh, just generally when we think about attacks, if someone is able to operate inside a pod, let's say that has a uh, Kubernetes service account attached, then they have sort of whatever privileges that service account has. And then if you've used workload identity or something similar to like match that Kubernetes service account up with a Google service account, then they also have whatever privileges that service account had. So if it was like, I don't know, be able to read out of a certain bucket or publish to a pub sub or whatever it is. Um, so we haven't seen attackers do that and be sort of like workload identity aware and like go after the Google resources, but sort of once you have that compromise there, there's no reason you wouldn't have that access uh, if you, if like that's what the area that you've compromised. Yeah. Awesome talk. Um, Thanks. I didn't even know about the system anonymous stuff. That's crazy. Uh, <laughs> do you guys have an opinion on that being defaulted on? I know you mentioned you were going to put it on the schedule for SIG off. Like, yeah. what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think, like, we've, it's been a default for a while now, and it has a bunch of dependencies. We talked about a few of them. And so I think we need to tread fairly carefully there, but it would be great if there was a third option that was kind of uh, allow the discovery role to work, but don't let anyone else bind anything else to this. Like, so there's not a sharp edge there anymore. I think, like, that's, that's the sort of thing we're going to go discuss in SIG and see if we can be, like, hey, can we just leave discovery there and not break the stuff that's, that, that is like quite, quite a large amount of dependencies on, um, but also remove this shop edge where, where people can go uh, configure stuff, uh, bind stuff to this when they probably shouldn't. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the talk, it's great. Um, wondering if you're gonna suggest other cloud providers to adapt to something similar? Uh, in terms of disallowing it as the default? Yeah, I, uh, part of sharing here is, is definitely like uh, bringing awareness and uh, we, I, I've talked to the security leads of other cloud providers pretty regularly. I talked to them yesterday about this subject, so we'll, we'll see, yeah. Cool, all right, thanks a lot. <laughs>